All right, I think we're gonna get started here. Um, hope everybody enjoyed their lunch and the nice, beautiful San Diego weather outside and it get too hot. Um, so we're gonna start with, this is track four, what's now, innovations in rare disease. And um, again, hope you enjoyed your lunch. That was also sponsored by Pfizer. So my name is Jessica Shiles and I'm gonna be your room host for this afternoon. Just as a reminder, this is going to be live streamed and we just wanna welcome all of our guests that are streaming live and just remind everybody that they can download our app and you can use that for live question and answers at the end. And the way that we're gonna do the question um, afterwards is both presenters are gonna speak and then we're gonna leave about 20 minutes afterwards to, to be able to answer um, the questions that you have. So who I'm gonna present to you today is we have Ryan Taft, Vice President, or Scientific Research of Scientific Research at Illumina, and Chamol Chowdhury, um, both clinical laboratory or the clinical laboratory director at Rady Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine, who will both share the importance of genome sequencing and, poten and the potential of getting a disease diagnosis faster um, in this season of genome, or, sorry, in this session of genome sequencing, hope, promises, and limitations. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Ryan Taft. So, thank you very much. Uh, this is by far my favorite conference of the year. Lots of old friends, uh, smiling faces, so I'm, I'm always delighted to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about the power and promise of whole genome sequencing, but I also talk about some of the hazards, pitfalls, and challenges uh, we still face in terms of getting this technology to every patient who needs it. But I wanted to start with something that I thought was quite inspiring. I was uh, very privileged to go to a meeting at the UN earlier this year, uh, which was entirely focused on rare diseases. And this is a quote from one of the World Healthcare uh, World Health Organization directors. And I'm just going to read it real quickly, even though it's up on the screen, because I think it's incredibly powerful. Uh, Leaving no one behind, uh, which is a key phrase for the UN Sustainable Development Goals, includes all those with a rare disease or without a diagnosis across the globe. This is my next part is my favorite. Just goodwill from all of us is not enough. We have a political and moral imperative to help these individuals. And to me, this is a kind of a remarkable set of statements strung together from somebody at the World Health Organization. Uh, it is highly likely that rare diseases will be called out specifically in UN legislation uh, that will be put forward next month. And I think it's an incredibly positive sign for the rare disease community. Uh, but we know we have lots of challenges ahead of us still. Um, so this is some numbers from a study we published uh, late last year where we started to look at kind of what's the real cost of rare disease patients, at least in the U.S. healthcare system. Um, so you can see some of those key numbers here, uh, $77,000 higher cost per discharge. So this is not the total duration of the care of this patient. This is a single discharge. Uh, these patients stay up to six days longer in the hospital. Their mortality rates are five times higher. They get four times more procedures. And then the number at the bottom is the real take-home message. If you looked at all the discharges and said, give me all of them that look like they might have a rare disease, they're about 10% of total discharges. But if you look at total costs, they're almost half of the national health care bill for pediatric patients. Um, so an incredibly high cost, incredibly high burden. So my question that I wake up and try to address every day is how do we bend the cost curve? How do we change this entire dynamic? And the thing that I work on is whole genome sequencing. So before we get to that, I just want to talk a little bit about genomes for anybody who's not familiar. The way I like to think about the genome, the instruction set that makes you who you are, is it's kind of nature's ultimate data compression experiment. How can we fit as much information in as small a space as humanly possible? So it's three billion letters long, so it's a lot already. But just to give you a sense of the scale, if you took a single genome from a single cell and stretched it out, it would be six feet long. If you took all the DNA from all the cells in your body and stitched it all together, it would go from the Earth to the sun and back 70 times. So it's an incredible amount of information. So because it's so big, evolution has come up with really cool ways to kind of package this down. Um, so one of those ways is chromosomes. So we all have 23 pairs of chromosomes. You can think about it as big bundles of DNA. We have about 20,000 genes, um, and those genes only occupy about 1.5% uh, of the genome. So there's lots of space in between these genes. And we know about 5,000 disease genes. And so the game we're really playing for 
80% of rare disease patients is how do we dig through all that information as quickly as possible and find the one letter in many cases that is out of place and is making this patient ill. So you can see across the top there, that kind of blue diagram, this is a common way genes are displayed. Um, the big boxes, the big blue boxes are called exons. These actually have the instructions to make proteins. We'll come back to that in a second. And the lines in between them are called introns. They're, they're just the spaces between the exons. And so you can see we have an original sequence and a mutated sequence. In this case, we just have a single letter changed, and that's caused a change to the protein. All genes encode instructions for proteins, and when those proteins are no longer functioning well, now, now we have a problem. So the real uh, kind of advance and kind of revolutionary change in how we address this problem has been the advent of what we call next generation sequencing. So on your left, we have Sanger sequencing, which I would consider an analog technology. So you have to look at a waveform and really kind of peer at it in some cases to see is the reference sequence, the original sequence, really different than the sequence that I'm looking at now. And if you look on your right, we have next generation sequencing. And this is a true digital readout of the genome. I think this is the real kind of crux of, of why this technology is so powerful. So for every base in the genome, you're gonna sequence that at least 30 to 40 times. And in some applications, you're gonna sequence it a thousand times. So the robustness and the quality of the data is, is really unparalleled. And it allows us to do things in terms of genetic diagnosis that were absolutely science fiction as little as 10 years ago. So the really good news is that the cost of this sequencing has declined precipitously over the last 20 years. So the first human genome that was done roughly 20 years ago cost over a billion dollars. The next one cost about $100 million. And you can see that blue line on this chart is the continued decrease in price over time. You can see the green line is the continued increase in the number of genomes sequenced, and that looks like a pretty big number. We now have about a million and a half genomes sequenced worldwide, but when you compare that to the total rare disease patient population, 250 to 350 million individuals, or indeed the global population, this is still a drop in the bucket. We are still at the very, very beginning of this journey. Um, you can see on the right-hand side, um, the, uh, there's a indication there of the number of variants in the human genome that have been described or fully characterized. This is just pointing out that although we're now sitting on a lot of data, we still don't completely understand a lot of the human genetic variation that we're looking at. And that's why we're all interested in sequencing many more patients and many more individuals across the globe. So particularly for, for this meeting and for this audience, I wanted to talk a little bit about the different kinds of tests that genomic sequencing enables. So at the top here, we just have kind of a whole bunch of genes floating around. That's our genomic DNA. And there's lots of different ways we can interrogate that DNA. So we can talk about panels, exomes, or whole genomes. So just to walk through those really quickly, panels are going to specifically target just a few genes. It can be as little as 10. It might be up to 100. And you're going to have a lot of depth of sequencing. So we, we had that plot a few uh, slides ago. So you might have 100 or 1,000x uh, coverage in terms of reading each of those bases for a panel, but you're not looking at very much of the genome. An exome is gonna look at all the genes in the genome, uh, but it's not gonna do it terribly deeply. And with a whole genome, you're gonna have lower depth of coverage, so you're not gonna sequence each base as many times, but you're actually gonna get data from absolutely everything. Each of these have their applications, um, but I think we're seeing more and more momentum around whole genome sequencing because of the robustness of the test and because of the completeness of the test. One of the things I think that's really key in rare diseases is we want a testing platform that can capture any possible type of mutation, and whole genome provides us that opportunity. So this is just a, a quick table to kind of touch on that, and I can make any of this information available to anybody who, who would like to have it. But across the top on this table, we have different kinds of uh, historical molecular genetic tests. And uh, along our rows there, we have different kinds of mutations. So small mutations, large mutations. So anybody who's in the space, we're talking about single nucleotide variants or copy number changes. And we can see that we have challenges across all of these historical technologies. But whole genome sequencing, either in practice or in principle, is able to tick each of these boxes, which really gives us an unprecedented insight into the genetics of these individuals. 
And we're starting to see this play out um, in true clinical studies of these patients. Um, so this is a collection of studies over the last couple of years looking at the diagnostic efficacy of whole genome sequencing across a fairly wide spectrum of clinical indications here. And you can see that even if it's used as the last test, so other tests have been done, the diagnostic efficacy, the number of patients being diagnosed is still quite high. And as a first-tier test, which is what I personally advocate for, that diagnostic efficacy is even higher. And the rationale there is, why not do the most complete test for the patient the first time they present at the clinic? Um, there's a tremendous number of important studies here and elsewhere in the literature, um, but I'm just going to focus on the one here that's on the far right, the Sochia et al. Uh, 2019. And this, this is a study that we actually did through a philanthropic offering we have at Illumina called iHope. Um, so a few years ago, we started philanthropically providing clinical whole genome sequencing. Uh, at that time, it was kind of to tens of kids a year, tens of pediatric patients. Um, that program has now grown where we're doing hundreds of patients a year. It's still a drop in the bucket, but it's, it's a meaningful increase. And we've also developed a network of clinical laboratories who are also philanthropically donating clinical whole genome sequencing. Uh, we have a big vision for this network. I want to grow it to tens of thousands of patients. Um, but today, I just want to tell you a, a little bit about the network itself in terms of the scope of the number of countries we're touching and then talk a little bit about one particular clinic. So one of the things that we're particularly proud of is that we're now touching, uh, although in some cases very lightly, every populated continent on, on the planet. Um, so we have partnered with clinical sites who have access to patients who are resource limited. Uh, they identify the patients and then they send it to Illumina HQ for sequencing. So we have a clinical laboratory inside Illumina. Uh, we are never gonna scale that to kind of take over the world. That's not our business model. We wanna enable the world to do that. Um, but one of the things that allows us to do is really pressure test what a genome can do, particularly in, in at-risk and at-need populations. And one of our most successful collaborations through IHOPE has been with a clinic just across the border in Tijuana called Hospital Infantil de las Californias. This is an entirely volunteer clinic. And uh, we work with some incredible clinicians, Dr. Marilyn Jones and Diane Master Fry, who have been volunteering their time at this clinic for almost 30 years. And we now have this kind of incredible set of activities that happen uh, where Dr. Jones and Diane identify patients that they think would benefit from whole genome sequencing. Those patients come into the clinic from all across northern Mexico on genome days. Uh, and I just want to pause there. We're having genome days in, in Tijuana. I think that's, that's, that's remarkable. <laughs> Um, we've so far done about 100 cases um, through this program, and the really impressive thing for us has been we've found mutations, genetic aberrations across the entire spectrum. Small changes, big changes, gross chromosomal abnormalities. And then this paper we published, we, we published on the first 60, uh, and we showed that we had a 68% diagnostic yield. That meant we were able to diagnose 68% of these patients. And I think that's important to us for two reasons. So standard of care in this population would be 0%. So that's a massive lift. Um, and even getting kind of best-in-class testing, for example, here in the US, we'd expect maybe somewhere in the 40 to 50% range. So for us, this was, this was an important number. Even more importantly, though, we were able to follow these patients and understand if a diagnosis was able to have an impact. Now, the dogma that we heard from, from many people was that, look, this is such a resource-limited community, even if you provide a diagnosis, there's nothing going to happen. And that's not what we found at all. So 48% of these kids had a change in management. And I just want to give you two examples of this. So here's a, a young lady. She was 13 at the time. And you can see her clinical presentation at the top. It's quite severe. Growth deficiency, behavioral issues. She hasn't developed secondary sexual characteristics. And she has epilepsy. And what we were able to find with a single genome without doing anything fancy is she actually had five distinct molecular diagnoses. Now, when we presented this to the clinical team, their mouth literally fell open and later said, if we had found one of these diagnoses, would it would have stopped. And so, so to me, this is the incredible power of a genome. So just very quickly, she has a single letter change in a gene that causes epilepsy. She has a de novo, so that means it's just unique to her, uh, deletion that gives her two additional conditions. She has an inherited cancer susceptibility disorder, and she has what's called mosaic uniparental disomy, the short arm of chromosome 11, and we got that all in one test. Now, the really amazing thing is that there was enough evidence to give this little girl cannabidiol based on literature that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and her seizures are now controlled. 
So we got one test, five molecular diagnoses, and a treatment that's costing her cents a day and has completely changed her quality of life. So this is, this is where we're going. This is what I wanna see happen everywhere. We had another case that was similar, and I think this is important for, for a slightly different reason in terms of the network effect that's currently going on. We had patients come through, they didn't have a mutation in any known disease gene, but they had a mutation in a gene that just looked and smelled bad. We put it in a system called Gene Matcher, which connects laboratories all over the globe, and we found a connection to a group in Canada within half an hour. Um, the clinicians were on the phone with each other an hour after that, exchanging notes. They realized they had now evidence of a new disorder. So we had patients in Canada, patients in Tijuana. They are phenotypically almost identical. Then the group in Canada said, we've been trying supplemental B6 in these patients. Have you thought about trying that in yours? Of course, they hadn't thought about that. Literally drove down to Costco, got supplemental V6, drove it back across the border and started giving it to these kids, and now their seizures are controlled. Now, this didn't cure them, and, and I mean, we all in this room know the rare disease patient journey, but their parents have been immensely grateful for that change in the, in the quality of life, and I think those are meaningful. So we've still got widespread use. Shamul's gonna talk about the incredible work Radies is doing in the neonate population. I'm talking about work going on really in the developing world, but this is happening all over the world, and I'll talk a little bit more about what's happening in the UK. But we've still got some big barriers to adoption. So the first is standards. We hear this all the time. How do I know that a genome is good enough? How do I know that a genome from laboratory A and laboratory B are the same? And I think the good news is that this is changing quite rapidly. Um, we now have a new consortium with both Radies and Illumina as part of called the Medical Genome Initiative, and we're pushing on this hard. So we want to get to a place where everybody is confident that a genome is a genome and a genome, and you know what you're getting. So this gap is going to close, but it's going to take a little bit more time, and I should say this isn't the only effort going on in this space. The FDA is active, as are most of the professional societies. In terms of education, I can't tell you the number of clinicians I talk to who have no idea that this technology exists. I've even been accused of uh, peddling science fiction. Um, and so we, we really have to continue to educate the clinician. And here's just one example of a course that's being offered by Children's Mercy that's trying to close this gap. Um, we're also very mindful, of course, of the patients and the families, because as I'll talk about in a couple slides, this is often the conduit for a clinician to get information about this. So we have to continue that education. And, and the public. Um, we have new venues, I think, for getting this information out into the public domain. And uh, that includes, for example, this new TV show called Chasing the Cure, um, which has given us a platform to actually talk about whole genome sequencing in, in the public domain. So access is the one I'm kind of most excited to talk about, because when I started giving a talk like this five years ago, there wasn't a lot to say in terms of insurance coverage, and that has changed dramatically. So I just pulled this plot from some internal data that we have, and if you look at total lives covered in the US now for whole exome or whole genome sequencing, we now have actually 60% of the US population covered for these tests. Uh, five years ago, that was basically 0%. So we have come a long way. Uh, and we can talk about why it might not feel like this is actually the case uh, on the next slide. Um, whole genome sequencing itself is actually only a small proportion of that coverage, but it too is coming along. Um, so we've had an incredible decision by Blue Cross Blue Shield of California to start to cover this. A lot of that has been driven by Rady's work. Uh, Priority Health is covering this, and now five state Medicaid programs are also covering it. So we're seeing tremendous momentum here. And the last one I wanted to mention from, from a true international standpoint is that the NHS, the National Health Service, in the UK is now going to be covering whole genome sequencing as standard of care for rare disease patients starting in 2020. So we are seeing a sea change in terms of access to these technologies as in large part because of the data that's now been generated. Um, we still have to work hard on this, and I think groups like Global Genes and the patient advocacy groups represented in this room can do more to educate and pressure the system, um, but we are on a very good tilt right now in terms of closing that gap. So I, I wanted to end with just a few thoughts uh, in terms of you know, my interaction with patients um, and clinicians uh, in terms of where, where we go next. So the diagnostic efficacy of these tests is gonna to continue to get better. The technology is on an incredible course and it's gonna to continue to improve. And so I think we should all be super pleased about that. Physician education and awareness is really key to closing many of these gaps. Um, again, it's, it's remarkable how many clinicians simply don't know this test exists, don't know how to order it, don't know which one to order. And that's a gap we've all gotta close. Um, access and insurance coverage is increasing. Um, but again, testing is only gonna occur if a family or clinician or caregiver 
um, can kind of point out that this test is the right thing to do. Um, clinical presentation matters. I get this question a lot. How much does it matter in terms of the information that the laboratory gets? It matters a tremendous amount and can really help refine uh, that search for the key mutation. Um, now we're starting to get questions about reanalysis. How often th should this be pursued? If my loved one was sequenced five years ago, um, should I pursue reanalysis at this point? I think the take home message is yes, but there's a lot of nuance in there. And the field does not have a consensus on how frequently this should be done. Um, but the rate of change in terms of our knowledge base, in terms of disease causing mutations, is on an exponential curve. And so it makes a lot of sense for many people to consider this. And the last one is that all sequencing tests are not created equal. Um, so there are some lab tests that are phenomenal and some that aren't. And so um, I think it's really imperative to be as educated as possible about this testing as it occurs so that you understand what you're getting back. Um, so with that, I'll stop. I'm only two minutes over, which is like a, that's a record for me. Um, and so uh, Shamul is now going to come up and talk about the incredible work that they're doing at Radies, and then uh, we'll, we'll take questions jointly after that. I was planning on him taking up the whole time. Uh, so uh, I, I had the fortunate uh, privilege of being at Illumina, working at Illumina, Illumina when Ryan came on board and uh, his passion for uh, rare disease patients and getting patients uh, a diagnosis and access to testing is unparalleled. So uh, I feel very fortunate to call Ryan a, a friend and colleague. So uh, I, I, I'm very excited to be part of this session. Uh, I'm a lab director at Rady Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine. Kind of my, my main job is analyzing genomes writing clinical reports and communicating this information to physicians. Uh, we've been on this incredible journey for the three years I've been at Rady, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about our experience and how it kind of ties into the things Ryan was talking about as we think about rare and undiagnosed disease. So our institution, uh, at a glance, our mission lines up almost perfectly with global genes and to prevent, diagnose, treat, and cure childhood diseases through genomic and systems medicine research. So this mission statement was formed in 2014, and we haven't moved off of this mission statement. Uh, and it, as we go along and we sequence more patients, it only strengthens our resolve in, in pushing forward with this mission. And so we have a clinical genome center embedded within our nonprofit research institute uh, that's uh, clinically certified by the governing bodies for us to perform clinical rapid whole genome sequencing. Okay, so our focus has been uh, for children in the intensive care unit, be the neonatal, pediatric, or cardiac intensive care units. And this cycle uh, that I present here as kind of the current state, our, our standard of care, uh, is this is what you see in the intensive care unit, but I think it'll be very familiar to other people uh, in the outpatient setting as well, right? It's just in a different time course and, and time urgency in the intensive care unit. So we have a child with a disease of unknown etiology, a search for a diagnosis, try a first-line treatment, either gets better or worse. If it's worse, try a second-line treatment, and on we go. Uh, and in the intensive care unit, this can lead to multiple outcomes, perhaps getting better and getting discharged, uh, palliative care for children with life-limiting illness, death uh, way too often, anxiety, suffering, and tremendous cost to the healthcare system. And traditionally, genomic testing or genetic testing First of all, very hard to get access to it in the inpatient setting that I'm sure people are aware of. And uh, the traditional testing is way too long to affect clinical care and decision making in the intensive care, care unit. Six weeks is way too long uh, for many of these children where they're presenting with very critical illness where every minute and every hour and every day counts. So our vision is to change this paradigm and provide rapid whole genome sequencing for a subset of patients in the intensive care unit. Our numbers and our studies have shown that each year in the US, this could be anywhere from 30 to 50,000 kids per year. Uh, right now, we're in the, in the order of doing hundreds of these right now. Uh, and so as you can see, this particular use case, the intensive care unit, lines up very well with our global picture, right? We're all trying to tackle the same questions. We want to get children earlier access to testing, we want the testing to be more robust, as comprehensive as possible right off the bat, to eliminate the sequential testing paradigm 
uh, having to go through either wrong diagnoses or sequential testing and move forward uh, in this new era of making a diagnosis and, uh, as stated here, genomic medicine. So within our cohort, we've been diagnosing anywhere between 30 to 40 percent of our kids. We're also traditionally sequencing kids, uh, sequencing kids that traditionally have not been sequenced before. So a lot of uh, what has been kind of holding the field back is we've been very selective of the kids we've been sequencing. We're trying to encourage others to think about this broader. We actually don't know what the prevalence of most of these genetic diseases are because we're not sequencing broadly enough to see it. And again, even within our limited experience of three years, we can see that hypothesis bearing out genetic disease is much more common than we ever thought in the intensive care unit. And we can really make a difference, as you can see, uh, for change in management uh, in, a, in a, a large portion of these kids. So why do we emphasize speed? Why do we think it's important? I touched on a little bit, especially in the NICU, being able to do the most comprehensive test possible, timely targeted treatments are associated with better patient outcomes, as I showed in the previous slide. And we've been working diligently to present this work, increase the number of patients, uh, to pro provide this evidence to the stakeholders uh, nationally and internationally that this should become the new standard of care. So uh, this is just one example I wanted to take. Uh, you know, you will often hear uh, you can make a diagnosis and, uh, you know, can't really do much with it. Uh, you know, I would like to push back on that. I do realize we have a lot of work to do in the field, but there are certain conditions that we can do a lot with. So this is uh, a very common phenotype we see in the intensive care unit. Uh, children presenting with seizures or epileptic encephalopathy. I see a certain percentage of these kids have a genetic disease. Very, heterogene uh, very heterogeneous. Uh, we've seen uh, children with multiple variant types making diagnoses in these genes, so certain technologies may, may not be able to pick them up. And very specific treatment guidance, this is just a subset uh, of what's out there, and we have had multiple diagnoses uh, in, in, in a select number of these genes in our experience. So uh, again, there is probably more information uh, that's out there in terms of the actionability of this information. And again, providing it in a time uh, when you're within the window to really make a difference from these kids, we've seen the impact of that, even outside of a specific therapy, but avoiding particular procedures, uh, being able to do the appropriate follow-up for uh, diagnosed genetic disease. So this is now getting to be a quickly outdated uh, paper and slide, which I guess is a good thing for us as a community. Uh, when we started our endeavor, we wanted to take a, a snapshot of the landscape of genetic testing uh, in the pediatric population. So we did a literature search and did our best to try and see between genome sequencing, exome sequencing, and chromosomal microarray, what did the numbers tell us? And so this is a paper we published in 2018. It's called a meta-analysis of trying to make sense of where things stand with these various technologies. Now, one of the hardest problems we had were it was really hard to make comparisons because the studies were so heterogeneous. In terms of the different platforms, the patient populations, it made it really hard to, uh, to, to detect those differences between the platforms. But as, as you can see here, genome sequencing had a 41% diagnostic yield whole exome sequencing had 36, and chromosomal microarray had a 10% diagnostic yield. And as, as in many of you may be well aware, uh, chromosomal microarrays are widely reimbursed and are often used as the first-year test for children in the intensive care unit and even in the outpatient setting. And I guess we came up with the question, why, why would that be the case now? Um, uh, another thing I'd like to note is, uh, you see there wasn't very many papers in the whole genome sequencing branch, right? So this difference was not statistically different, but you were dealing with 9,000 kids down here, 300 kids up here. Uh, it's about what we expected. And again, as Ryan spoke to before, not all tests are created equal. And, and we touched on this in our Genomics 101 session yesterday uh, that we held, that uh, being able to determine what a test does and what a test doesn't do is really important. Providers, we're working on educating providers on that. And I think some of the responsibility, uh, honestly, will be coming to the patients as well to be able to, to look at those differences as we work on educating the workforce and the world in genomics. So this is the evidence in the world to date of intensive care unit uh, genome or exome sequencing. And and, and so these are, you see, not, again, not very many studies that are, that are out there. Uh, some of these are the work we've done. Some are others in Australia and, and the UK as well. And I, the things that, I guess, 
make us feel more and more assured that uh, this is definitely something we need to pursue full bore is that the numbers hold fairly steady. There are, you know, fluctuations in the diagnostic rate, but you do see overall this diagnostic rate in the clinical utility being high, a change in outcome being high. Here's some other studies that are ongoing. And why are the diagnostic rates so variable? So uh, as you sequence broader, potentially your diagnostic rate might go down. But uh, in, our, in our book, that's okay. Uh, if you're gonna select patients that you have a high suspicion of genetic disease, you're gonna have a higher diagnostic rate. But if you sequence broader for some of these kids that don't have uh, a classic syndrome or a dysmorphology or that's picked up by clinical genetics, again, we're missing a lot of kids that have genetic disease uh, based off of our inclusion criteria into these studies and cohorts. And so it depends heavily on your patient population. So establishing the evidence. Uh, so we started our work initially at Rady Children's Hospital. We're very connected to them at the hip here, just uh, across the road here in San Diego. And now we've broadened our network to 23 children's hospitals where we, uh, we provide rapid whole genome sequencing for their patients. Uh, we have uh, optimistic goals uh, of really expanding out this network but we know that there's too many kids in the intensive care unit to sequence for us to do them all. So, uh, so part of our mission is, again, disseminating this information and hopefully getting to a place where, again, our goal is that every kid that needs it will be able to get this test. And so this is kind of where we view ourselves in this trajectory into implementing a new standard of care. So what we know from medicine in the past history is that from the concept of the idea, it typically takes 17 years for a new standard of care to be implemented. Um, so we started kind of this initial trials of the rapid whole genome sequencing in around 2010 or 11, so unfortunately, if we continue on this path, we're gonna be in the same boat uh, of 17 years, and that's way too long. So really hope to, hoping to accelerate that timeline, and again, this will take everyone uh, involved in these studies. So we've shown efficacy, we've shown some effectiveness. This is the current pricing uh, for a rapid whole genome sequencing singleton, this proof of concept of being able to do it uh, as fast as a day, that's not our clinically validated pipeline right now. Typically, we're getting results within three days from when the sample comes in the door to getting a preliminary result to a physician. So now we need to move to the implementation studies. So now this is really identifying in which context, which patients we need to sequence, identifying those barriers. Ryan touched on some of those barriers that we need to tackle, and those are big things to tackle for us in the next couple years adopt and prepare, implement, and then hopefully we move to a place of sustainability. And I really hope it's not seven years, but more like two years uh, for us to be able to get to this place of, again, providing access uh, for children in the intensive care unit. So this is our vision for the future. Uh, so these are uh, pictures from our conference last year of three children uh, where we impacted their lives with rapid whole genome sequencing. Uh, and some of them are actually here today, uh, so it's been great to be able to see them. Uh, this is our CEO, uh, Dr. Kingsmore. Uh, this is our uh, CEO of the hospital, Patrick Frias. This is Sebastiana. Uh, we diagnosed her with KCNQ2 epileptic encephalopathy. Uh, Riley, who has uh, tyrosine hydrox uh, hydroxylase deficiency, and Maverick, who has ALDH7A1 uh, uh, B6-dependent uh, epilepsy. And so. In each of these cases, we're able to provide a diagnosis for these kids within a week uh, of when the sample in the door, and we've seen the dramatic impacts and uh, thinking about children in those similar situations that did not have access to the testing and what the difference in their lives might be. So we always come back to this when we're thinking about this in the big picture and these smiling faces and these kids playing together. And again, our vision is to, to not, this, uh, not, not have this just be three kids uh, but thousands or millions of kids uh, in, in the future. So an exciting study I'd like to talk about is something we've been partaking here in the state of California. Uh, we're fortunate uh, through uh, partnerships with Illumina and a lot of people uh, behind the scenes, we were able to get a $2 million state appropriated fund in the budget to sequence Medi-Cal babies from five children's hospitals as a quality improvement project. Uh, to do rapid whole genome sequencing over 18 months. 
with the main endpoints looking at clinical utility and cost effectiveness to hopefully set the stage for rapid whole genome sequencing to become a Medi-Cal covered benefit in the near future. And so this is, uh, this is the data that we have to date, uh, a little bit outdated, but we have Rady Children's Hospital, Valley Children's, UC Davis, UCSF, and Children's Hospital at Orange County. And what the numbers show us is we're diagnosing about 43% of those kids and a change in management in 31% of that cohort. Our preliminary financial analysis, uh, we haven't really solidified the numbers, but we've shown uh, anywhere between a $1 million to $2 million savings to the healthcare system as well due to decreased hospital stay, avoidance of procedures, uh, things of that nature. So this has been a very gratifying pilot for us to show the effectiveness of this testing in multiple children's hospitals across California. We look forward to establishing this, this playbook in other children's hospitals in other states. In fact, Florida just got approval for them to uh, take on, I guess we're calling it baby gator for, for Florida. Uh, they got a uh, budget in their, in, their, in their state budget to, to, to perform rapid whole genome sequencing for a subset of their cases too. So touching on uh, what we're seeing in our experience and thinking about sequencing broader, one of the things that we've seen with our testing is, uh, yes, we're diagnosing kids and syndromes that we've seen before that other technologies can detect, but we're diagnosing these kids earlier than they ever had before. And so what we're learning is those kids don't look like what I learned in the textbooks when I was studying for my boards years ago. They haven't presented with certain phenotypes, and the genetics is actually taking us to the phenotype, as opposed to how we've traditionally done this, in that the phenotype drives us to where, what gene it is. And so we're, we're really looking at a place, again, where we've we sequenced about 1,000 plus probands so far uh, in our experience, and we're learning more, and the same genes are popping up at a frequency that, again, is much more common than what's in the, in the textbooks. And so this is, again, some of the conditions that are reoccurring. And we're really hoping that we get to a place where if we have enough of these kids, we're tracking their outcomes. We're really working on establishing uh, not only therapies, but really how do, we, how do we manage these kids over the course of their lifetimes. And uh, again, this list continues to grow. So I want to also talk about this whole concept of uh, the barriers to rapid whole genome sequencing and the things that keep us up at night. So uh, I talked about some of the success stories. We have multiple stories too where we sequence the children too late and we missed a window to really make a positive uh, impact in the outcomes of their lives. Uh, this was a 16-year-old child with seizures, global developmental delay, uh, hormone deficiencies. Uh, we sequenced this child, oops, sorry about that, and we found a homozygous uh, variant in MC2R, and the treatment is actually a very, uh, very simple treatment of oral hydrocortisone. If we could have sequenced this child when they first presented, when they were very little, it could have been a much different outcome uh, compared to sequencing this child when they were 16. Uh, this is a three-month-old uh, that had a, a cardiac defect, uh, had a whole host of problems, had a trach, Pierre-Robain syndrome, and uh, this is typically a child that you, know, you might consider for whole genome sequencing. Uh, and what the doctors kept saying when we looked back at this is something was just not quite right about this kid. Uh, but they couldn't really put their finger on it. And so we did make a diagnosis with, again, another condition that has a treatment, uh, D-galactose. But again, the window for maximal benefit was missed in this child. So this is my last slide, the barriers and challenges to address. Uh, is expense justified? Uh, our data has shown that it is. Even with the current cost of sequencing, this saves money uh, to the healthcare system. So who do we need to convince and what data do we need? We need a line on that as a field. Interpreting genomes. So we spelled, still spend too much time, but there's a lot of exciting tools and developments uh, helping us really cut down that analysis time and helping us scale so that we're ready. Uh, limitations of genome sequencing approaches. So as we validate these different types, basically every new new piece that we add to our offering requires a collaboration of multiple institutions. So this is really going to take a network. Education, outreach, and collaboration with genetic services. So how do we do this responsibly? Uh, how do we return these results? How do we make sure the system is ready for this information? And the education and outreach for our new trainees, our new MDs coming into the system, the patients and families. 
And then again, uh, the clinical utility, how do we maximize this amazing opportunity that we have, access to treatments, uh, and the development of more novel drugs. I know that's being touched in sessions here uh, at the conference, and this is something we're actively looking at and par partnering with uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies in trying to see what impact can an earlier diagnosis make uh, in the outcomes of these patients. And so uh, I'll end it with, uh, in terms of the education piece, uh, about a year or two ago, our institute really identified education being one of the major gaps uh, for us to be able to, to move forward with widespread implementation. And so we've really doubled down and, and put our money where our mouth is in partnering with the Vermont Oxford Network, which is a quality assurance network of 1,500 NICUs throughout the, throughout the world. We're doing a webinar series. Just last week I did a webinar to uh, this network in how to interpret a clinical genetic report. So uh, we're starting from Genomics 101 with some of these physicians, but we're invested in trying to make that happen. And then with our partnership with Illumina, we actually run a monthly rapid precision medicine grand rounds uh, that rotates between the Children's Hospital and the Mesa here in San Diego. Again, with that same goal of the education and engagement being one of those main barriers we have to tackle. And so I'd like to acknowledge the team at Rady Children's Hospital and looking forward for a spirited Q&A session here coming up. both of them back up here for about a 15 minute question and answer session. I have some live stream, so if you guys have questions that are um, on online and you wanna pop them on here, I can get to them. And then otherwise, I know that Ryan, Ryan actually wants to ask the first question. Yeah, I, I get dibs on the first question. Oh, is that uh, allowed? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think uh, we're, we're mic'd, so. Um, so Shmuel, that's the first time I've seen the baby bear data. Mm -hmm. That's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, what's the timeline for that project to close and to get reported to the state? Because I think that, mm -hmm. that's going to be a game changer. Yeah, so uh, the latest of the baby bear is we initially were targeting to sequence 100 kids. As you can see, uh, we were under budget, so we're able to sequence more kids. We're targeting around 135 to 140 kids. We're gonna submit our final report to the state in about a month from now. We have the drafts flying back and forth right now, and we're, you know, I guess, cautiously optimistic about what the outcome uh, of that will be. So uh, looking forward to hopefully uh, present some good news about that in the near future. That's really cool. Hi, thank Hi. you so much. Um, so I have several colleagues in the precision medicine space, and as part of their career advancement, they sequenced their whole genomes. And of course, um, without fail, they found mutations, which then led to additional healthcare and, um, you know, for otherwise healthy, very brilliant people. So I guess my, my question is, as this becomes more widespread, um, what are you doing or what safeties are in place? Because you're gonna pick up all sorts of things which may or may not lead then to a diagnosis. Um, so how are you handling that? I can take the first stab. Sure. So, uh, so that particular concern was uh, on the forefront when these initial studies came out uh, and the FDA actually uh, had very specific guidance in terms of what we could and could not report. Uh, I think one of the distinctions right off the bat to make with this is really our focus has been on patients that have a disease and trying to explain that uh, as opposed to uh, healthy individuals uh, investigating their genomes. So, you know, we're very much focused in that first case rather than the second. Uh, our evolution, and I think this kind of uh, goes with our times and our, our evolving kind of thirst for knowledge, uh, we've continued to kind of progress in terms of what we've been reporting back. Uh, as part of the offering. At first, it was very, very strict in terms of being clear-cut diagnoses, and that's all we can report back. Now we do report back uh, incidental findings, so potentially medically actionable information that's not related to the patient's phenotype. But the central te theme of that being uh, we have information that perhaps may not be immediately medically actionable for the child, but we do have information that's immediately medically actionable for the parents. 
And the parent's well-being is obviously in direct interest of the child's well-being. So uh, overall, we felt that's the best thing to do. But parents do have the ability to opt out of it. So that's still, that's still their, their choice. And then a uh, topic that we touched on in the educational workshop, too, is we do report out some variants of uncertain significance. And uh, that was something we weren't allowed to do at first. Uh, but we thought it was the right thing to do because, again, we have uh, people out here in the community, be it physicians or families, that uh, can take this information and pursue things uh, even better than a laboratory and like myself can do. So again, it's kind of an evolving process, but that of what's returned in what setting is something that's always very much uh, on our mind. Can I take a quick yeah. swing at that one? So I, I, I want to really emphasize the first part of Shamul's answer. I think the clinical indication for testing is key. Right, so it's very different to test a kid who's presenting in the NICU versus a healthy adult. And so how that information is reported and what goes on the report is totally different. So when we look at kids and families with indications of a genetic disease, the, the data says only two to 4% of times are you gonna report anything that's not directly related to the clinical indication. And looking at those quote unquote secondary or incidental findings, the data actually shows that they are cost saving in the long term because you're starting screening processes earlier. So I, I think that this is a little bit of a red herring. Um, now, if it's done inappropriately and if you're reporting on variants that have no genetic, uh, no literature on them whatsoever, that's when you get into the problem. But if it's done appropriately, the data seems to be pointing that that's, that's actually a responsible thing to do. I think we need more studies on the downstream consequences of reporting those variants and how much incremental healthcare cost there actually is. But in my own experience, I mean, some of those secondary findings are like a mom with a BRCA2 mutation. Like, she needs to go get screened right now. She's already the primary caregiver. And if she goes down, the whole system goes down. And so I think, I think it needs more study and, and perhaps more, more nuance in terms of how we talk about that as a community. Hi, this is a question for Dr. Chowdhury. What advice would you give to an undiagnosed patient or patient caregiver who is proceeding with looking into um, whole genomic or exome sequencing for their child um, for going into like the free research that you offer, which is great, versus now like if their health insurance covers the cost, then they actually own the data, right? Um, what is the pros and cons of going through each? Or I don't know if they own the data, she's saying no, but uh, is there a pro and con for going into, you know, doing that sequencing through research versus doing it privately on your own, either self-funded or through your insurance company? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, okay. it's, a, it's, it's a great question because we kind of live in this world where we're kind of living in a little bit of a gray area. Uh, I think one, uh, one distinction I want to make for the testing that we do is that initially it was done under research protocols and now uh, we're offering it as a clinical service. So the Project Baby Bear is not a research endeavor. It's a, a clinical test with a clinical report uh, that's happening. So I think in, in the journey, uh, I do think that's still the most direct way is to see uh, either through one of your providers if you can get a clinical uh, exome or genome test. If that, if again, you're still searching for a diagnosis for that for your child. Uh, again, I think that's where it also gets into realizing what type of test is being ordered and what's being covered and, uh, and not covered from the, uh, the dollars, but what the test is doing. Uh, as Ryan kind of spoke to, the variants and, and not all tests being created equal. And then I think if, if things are striking out in that sense, uh, then maybe is uh, pursuing some of the research angles. And again, there's great endeavors happening on that side right now. But uh, at least my, my sense of things is trying to go that route first. And then maybe if that's, if you're hitting barriers there, which again, there shouldn't be barriers. So we need to take care of that moving uh, to, to the next tier. I don't know, Ryan, if you had anything else to add to that? No, I think um, 
there continues to be a thin gray line between research testing and clinical testing. Um, and I think it really is dependent on the patient, the family, and what journey they're on, depending on which way they go. But I strongly agree with Shamul that we're now getting to a place where the thing you want is the bona fide clinical test, so you know exactly what you're getting. So that's, that's where you start, and then move into research as, as needed and as necessary. Yeah, one other point I want to make to that is, uh, you know, we're running clinical tests, uh, but we're finding variants in genes that haven't been characterized before. And so, like, as a laboratory, again, we're kind of in a unique space of delivering information that is, you know, not, uh, you know, clear-cut, uh, clinically significant, medically actionable information, but uh, there's a responsibility to get that information out, again, to, uh, to allow people to, to pursue things further, to, to perhaps push things over the line. So I think all laboratories have some sort of internal policy of what they report out and what, what scenarios. So again, like that nuance is something that's important to try and understand, and it's not always uh, very easy information to obtain if you're trying to get to that level of detail. We have about eight more minutes for our questions, so I'm going to get to a few more. Um, for the I Hope study, I may have misunderstood this, but you had a diagnostic yield of 65%. Um, what were the parameters to make that so high? Because that's wonderful, but that's much higher than what usually is published. Yeah, yeah. so I, I think the simple answer to that is Dr. Marilyn Jones <laughs> is why it was so high. Uh, so. Yeah, it, it, it was an interesting study. So I think there's a couple of reasons that's higher. One is that we were doing whole genome sequencing as a first line test. So these kids hadn't had any other testing. And so for us, one of the things we were testing is, can whole genome really pick up the things that those other tests would have, like a karyotype or a chromosomal microarray? And luckily, the answer was yes. So that, that's one reason it was higher. The second reason it was higher is that we were literally working with the person who wrote the textbook on pediatric dysmorphology to select the cases. And so if Dr. Jones thinks it's genetic, it's probably genetic. Um, the double edge to that sword was Dr. Jones was only passing us cases where she could not make a definitive clinical diagnosis based on her evaluation. So they were very challenging cases based on her assessment. Uh, but she is still, she's the world's expert, I mean, and, and so we had kind of a filter on the, on the front end. So both of those absolutely increased the diagnostic efficacy. Uh, I think the third thing um, was just the genome that we were using. So we had a, a highly advanced genome in terms of what we could deliver on, on that clinical report in terms of the number and type of variants, and so that boosted it as well. Okay. Based on your uh, experience with diagnosing pediatric epilepsy, is there an extension of whole genome sequencing to speed up the diagnosis and medical management of adult onset epilepsy? You want to take a swing at that? Uh, why don't you take a <laughs> So we're, we're about to um, embark on a clinical trial to address exactly this. It's going to be slightly broader, so it's going to be adult onset neurological disorders. Um, I think uh, we've got a good chance of actually having a very high efficacy in the adult population. Um, one of the gaps, we're going to get slightly technical for, for a minute, but um, genomes still have a hard time with low-level mosaics. So it's not a fully penetrant heterozygous mutation. It's present in 20% of cells. That's the one place where I can see genomes still having a, a challenge. I think the good news is that as costs continue to decline, what will happen is the relative depth of a genome will go up. So right now it's 30 to 40x. It's not impossible to imagine a world where that goes up many tens of x in the near future, and that will completely close that gap. But we don't have a lot of hard data in that space yet, and I think we've, we've got to generate it, but I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, one other thing I wanted to add to that is uh, the, the concept of a rapid whole genome sequencing in the intensive care unit and how that translates into other clinical settings, um, I think it'll translate very well. Um, we did do one pilot study where we did rapid whole genome sequencing in an adult cohort uh, presenting with myocardial infarction. And uh, again, for, for the cohort and how we think about these things, 
the diagnostic yield was relatively low, but the impact of those diagnoses were very high. So um, again, when I'm speaking about these things, I really want people to think about that of, um, you know, the diagnostic yield is an important metric, but for us to really uh, look under the hood in how that's affecting the management. So, you know, within that Mexico cohort that Ryan spoke about, a high diagnostic yield, but also very high percentage of the change of management. And so from, from our seat in as we think about the healthcare system, right, that's, that's some of the currency that they're, they're really looking for. So, uh, Ryan, I believe you had a slide that showed that 59% of uh, people in the U.S. have, um, in, in theory, would be able to get insurance coverage for a whole genome test. Yeah. Um, practically speaking, do you have any statistics on what fraction of people who actually try to get coverage for a whole genome test are able to actually get it covered? Because you mentioned it does feel like it's much lower than 59%. Yeah. Um, so, I don't, I don't have hard data. Um, I, I would say that the information we've seen suggests that the utilization of that coverage is still very low. Um, and my anecdotal kind of personal experience with patients is that you're still seeing denials for cases that are clearly genetic. Um, so to me, this comes back to education. Um, I can't count the number of times I've engaged with a medical director at an insurer and simply walked through like, this is why this makes sense, and their opinion changes during the course of the meeting. Um, so we, we just have a very big educational gap in terms of when this is appropriate, why it's appropriate, why it should be covered. And it, it really does stem, per my talk, it really stems across. It's medical directors, it's clinicians seeing the kids, it's the system as a whole. And so I think, I think we all have to work together to close that gap, and I think those, those appropriate utilization rates will, will go up. Yeah, we've been working at, uh, at Rady Children's for, uh, again, we're offering our whole genome as a uh, fee-for-service clinical service. We transitioned away from doing it on a research basis. And so we've been submitting uh, for insurance uh, authorization for the whole genomes uh, and working to collect that data. It's still very early in our evolution here, uh, but we have been able to have some providers approve uh, whole genomes. Again, with our, with our paradigm, it's, it's too slow. You know, we need to work on uh, how we can uh, decrease that gap to make sure the kids get the test right away. But, you know, as we're identifying people we need to uh, talk to, right, and, and really educate, uh, obviously, the uh, insurance companies and the policymakers are right near the top of our list with the physicians and the families. And let's not forget other providers. These are all these are all people that we, we need to be reaching out to. Hi, um, great presentation. I have a slightly different question. So I'm from Ida Gwadri Sridhar. My question is, um, given the complexities and costs and barriers in, in doing whole genome sequencing, what processes are you putting in place to share the data, um, potentially with registries and other organizations who could really benefit from the work that you're doing? Uh, so I can I can take the first stab at that. Um, so a lot of a lot of our work and a lot of our trials um, have come through the NIH that require you to share your data uh, into a, into a database that the NIH provides. Uh, we're also actively uh, working on our first submission to ClinVar to submit uh, some of our diagnostic variants, so other labs will have access to that information. Uh, and then the bigger picture outside of that, I think we're still trying to learn from the community where's the best place and what's the right platform to have the maximal benefit. I think there's a lot of good endeavors out there. There's a lot of standardization that's happening, but we're still in the big picture as we kind of build out our cohort uh, of kids and have that data. It's still a little bit unclear from, from my seat of where, where, that, where the field will tell us uh, is, is the right way to do it and in a responsible way uh, as there is a lot of, um, you know, there's a, a lot of privacy and, uh, and, and those considerations that, that again, the, the field is working through. Yeah, I guess, I guess two thoughts on that. So one is that I, I think, Per Shimmel's last comments, I think this is still, unfortunately, an unsolved problem. 
in terms of how the community is going to manage this data, aggregate it, and put it in such a form that it can be mined for appropriate information. We've got multiple registries, either spun up or spinning up, um, but we have uh, not a lot of crosstalk. We don't have common data infrastructure. So I've, I've been in at least a dozen meetings this year about how we solve this problem. Um, I think the good news is there's lots of people thinking about it because we have to solve it, um, but it's not solved yet. The, the second thing I'd point out is that this is a, uh, unfortunately, quite a US-centric problem. So a lot of the centralized healthcare systems are kind of solving this problem of themselves. So I was, I was in a meeting where I had US representatives and UK representatives, and we were talking about this problem, and the US representatives were saying, like, well, we're going to solve this problem by every patient owning their data. And the UK folks were, were like completely flummoxed by this. Why would I want to own my data? The NHS owns it. That's where it's supposed to be. Um, and so we might see some of the big data questions actually answered by governments like the UK and Canada, et cetera, in terms of trying to really aggregate that information and being able to execute on it. And we might see a more fractured landscape here in the US. I think the goal, at least that I have, is to try and reduce the amount of kind of disparate efforts there are and try to bring them together. But it's, it's, it's a tough problem. It's a real problem. We got to solve it as a community. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, I know this is really exciting and great research that you guys are doing, and there's a handful of more questions, but they will be available at the networking break um, following this that's hosted by um, Leedy and Biosciences. So if you want to follow up with them afterwards, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer any more of your questions that you have. Um, but we thank you guys so much for presenting and educating us today and sharing your passions with um, moving forward in the rare disease community. So thank you so much.